Awesome. So as we're just giving everybody a couple minutes to settle in, please rename yourself to include your first name and, you know, primary perspective. Where, where are you coming at from today? Are you coming at this from being a mother that is concer concerned about the space like myself, <laughs> a teacher, a youth, an investor, um, what organization are you, are you representing? Uh, and also in the Zoom chat, let's talk about what does a beautiful and healthy economy look like around youth well-being? And we'll dive into, into this a little bit more in, in just a bit. Uh, but we thought we'd just kind of get you started and, and thinking about that as, as we're settling in. You know, some, some tips for today. If you can have your video on, it would be great to, to see all of your faces. We recognize that there is a lot going on right now, so we completely understand if that is not possible for you today. Um, if you're not speaking, to, to please be on mute to avoid distractions. Uh, any questions that you have, please do put them in on the Zoom chat. And between myself, Todd, and Danny, we will find some space to, to answer those, make sure that they get answered, and feel free to use the, the reaction features as we're going through and, and we're talking today. So, you know, thank you all for, for joining us and being with us. Uh, as I said, we know that there's a lot going on and also there's many exciting sessions to choose from. So thank you for, for taking the next 30 minutes uh, to be here with us. Uh, I think you just heard uh, from my colleague, uh, Todd Hossein, the co-CEO of Second Muse, who was speaking earlier. My name is Natalia Argeman, and I am a director at Second Muse Capital. And we're really here today to talk a little bit about the way that we approach capital and have a quick brainstorming session where we really invite you to, to think with us as we're looking to develop, um, you know, building an economy around digital spaces for youth well-being. And if we take a look around at the world around us, we're, we're really at a crossroads. We do believe that it's time to start rebuilding the economy of the future. And I think we can all say that the recent world events have really demonstrated how fragile our systems are and question many of the assumptions and, and policies that have traditionally defined our, our economies. If we look at the way that economies and markets have grown, it's usually been at the expense of social, human, or environmental dignity. So what we start to see is rapidly expanding urban centers at a much higher rate we're also starting to see increased pollution in our oceans because as these cities were being designed the proper waste infrastructures were not being developed alongside with this rapid um, expansion and these are expensive expensive choices that that we have to be making um, or that have been made and we're really here questioning do we have to be making these 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 choices as we're thinking to build new economies and i was able to attend one of the sessions yesterday and one of the points that was raised was that you know it's hard to balance the need to increase digital well-being and the need to get a profit to survive in this economy and why, why is this the case? You know, we really believe that we don't have to be making these sacrifices. And what we do is we take what has been traditionally viewed as competing interest. So market return seeking investments, economic growth, social justice, environmental justice, and we strategically align pools of funding to create new investment opportunities that are really fostering inclusive and resilient economic growth. And we're able to do this by using a, a blended capital approach. So I'm gonna kick it over to Todd that's gonna give an example of, of what this actually looks like in one of the programs and 
funds that we're investing in alongside Circulate Capital and the Circulate Initiative. So Todd, take it away. Thanks, Natalia. Yeah, so, so just, as, just as Natalia um, was, um, um, was sort of introducing, there's this uh, about this idea of, um, you know, this approach to blended capital. I mean, so what, what we'll generally see with pools of funding is if you can imagine, um, if you can imagine, for instance, uh, four pools of funding, um, funding that's looking to invest in new business that's seeking market market returns, right? Think about venture funding or some other other types of investment that's seeking market returns. Think about uh, pools of funding that are focused on economic growth, right? Let's build our economy, let's create our economy. Oftentimes it's gonna be government funded, but it can also be foundation funded and otherwise uh, sort of uh, funded. Then think about pools of funding that are that are that are uh, coming to uh, address econ environmental uh, well-being, you know, uh, environmental organizations and nonprofit organizations, and then think about another pool of funding that's aiming to address uh, social justice. So, social justice, environmental justice, market return-seeking capital, and economic growth. Oftentimes, these are four contradictory uh, pools of funding with their own agendas that don't tend to include the agendas of the other sort, uh, sort of pools of funding. So, w w this this um. Of a fund that we're a partner in is focused on the elimination of ocean plastics. You know, ocean plastics is a um, really big problem. Um, it's it's hard even to know how big of a problem it is, since the measure good measurement um, uh, measurement is just starting relatively recently. But somewhere around the vicinity of 150 to 200 million metric tons of plastic live inside the ocean. We put somewhere around 10 million dollar 10 million um, uh, metric tons of plastic into the ocean each year. Um, about half of this plastic comes from these high leakage countries, right? So think about countries whose growth, GDP growth and population growth have gone faster than their ability to build appropriate waste management infrastructure. So even if, if you're the Four Seasons in, in Bali, you call a guy with a truck and he comes and picks it up. And as the price of oil goes up, the radius with which he's willing to drive your garbage away shrinks. And so there's these tragic you know, videos online that'll bring you to tears almost where you just see this you know, garbage plastics going into, into, into rivers that are then, of course, carried out into the ocean. Big problem. Um, we don't even know how big of a problem it is because plastic doesn't go away. Big plastic just turns into little plastic and animals eat little plastic and we eat little plastic. And so, and that messes with our endocrine systems and other physiologic systems. So big problem. We're just at the beginning of understanding the true cost of this, of this big problem. Um, it also, it also just so happens that in the, in the, especially in the informal sector, women are more abused in the waste supply chain than in just about any other supply chain. I mean, there's, there's tragic abuse that happens sort of in the, in the waste supply chain. So there's major social, social justice issues and uh, oppression cuts very strongly along gender lines uh, in Southeast Asia. Now, these high leakage countries tend to be concentrated around, high le around Southeast Asia. This problem is exacerbated because once China said, we don't want your, your trash anymore to the West, the West started to send it to places like Southeast Asia. So you're taxing a, a, a system that's already ill-prepared to deal with this increase in sort of waste, and now you tax it even further. So that's the problem that we're, that we're, sort, of say, that we're sort of saying. Now, the, the reality is that, gosh, waste, wa I mean, there's clearly an environmental problem that we have to solve, because that's a problem. But we're also building a waste you know, management industry. And there's, this, this is an economy. I mean, there's, you, you can build really healthy businesses in an economy based on the management of waste and the reuse of waste. I mean, gosh, there's an opportunity for social justice here because instead of women being the most abused in this economy, why don't you make women the beating heart of this new economy? You know, so there's an opportunity around social justice that you're seeing over here. And of course, there's real technologies that you're able to invest in, which can actually provide market returns because of what it is. And so one of the, 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 the concept of the way that we try to align our funding is that we try to take these different competing pools of capital and try to align them. So instead of them being taking out oxygen into the space and each competing for their own interests align. And so we have a fund, relatively small fund compared to the problem. It's a $106 million um, investment fund um, that's backed by multinational corporations who have heavy plastic supply chains, which, which, is, which is problematic. Now, what's more interesting, now that's, that's a drop in the bucket, right? The World Bank estimates you need $12 billion to address the waste management uh, problem in Vietnam alone, which is one of our priority countries. So this is, you know, the, the purpose of this funding is really to be catalytic, to prove an investment case. But that's one pool of funding. It also, because it's building an economy, we're able to align 
uh, the efforts that we do, the programming that we do on the ground, the support of the entrepreneurs with, envir with environmental NGOs that are actively trying to take uh, plastic out of the ocean. We're also able to align it with the, with the economic growth strategies of Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, India, and the Philippines. Because it also has a social justice angle, the, the, the government of Canada, who has a largely feminist economic uh, development uh, uh, agenda, is really interested in, in, in funding that. And what happens is that these pools of capital, instead of competing with each other, are now able to de-risk each other. Meaning, the funding from the Canada to, to make sure that women have a more prominent and a safer role within the economies now is able to align with actual investment capital to invest in their business, is able to align with support from the government to help them uh, come to market and is able to align with environmental NGO dollars. Now, the way that what we want to what we want to uh, do with you all for the next 15, 18 so minutes is go through the exercise in a really condensed form that we that we actually go through. Now, um, you know, digital spaces uh, that are um, that are digital spaces and digital experiences uh, for for young people is 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 a core is one of these examples of these opportunities. I mean, we we and so what? How would how do we think about it? Well, we have to think from the future. So we have to imagine. We have to see. Okay, well, there's a present where there's. We know that the present is problematic in relation to digital spaces and experiences and, and human thriving. If we can imagine a future that, if we can imagine a future where the efforts that we're doing in win and succeed, then we have really three questions to ask ourselves. In this future economy, when you did, you had an exercise uh, yes, uh, yesterday where it was like, imagine, imagine, uh, you know, a better internet or imagine a better economy or, or, around this kind of thing. Come from the place of that future, stand in that future and look back. And, and we, we went, you know, reflect on this for a couple of minutes and then start sharing some of these ideas in chat. In this future that's substantially better than the present, who are all the beneficiaries in this economy? Who, 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 who are, who are the beneficiaries of this new, this new economy with digital spaces and experiences that are that are helping humans thrive and in particular young humans thrive what are the benefits in the economy what do we see more of and then there's the other side which is define what social costs exists what do we see less of because when we build these economies with negative externalities be they social or be they environmental they are incredibly expensive um, Addressing problems later are much more expensive than addressing problems uh, sort of sort of earlier. So, so if so if we can if we can go back to the to the questions, and 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 start to share some ideas in the chat and have a conversation for for uh, for for fifteen minutes around who these beneficiaries are and what benefits they see and what are the social costs that exist, then we'll start to get an understanding of the landscape of what pools of funding we're, we might be able to align today to create an opportunity tomorrow that ultimately will be, will be, a, will be substantially better. Does that make broad sense what, 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 what we're asking? See some nodding heads. Great. If, if there's a question, feel free to put it in the chat. Feel free to also, uh, you know, um, uh, speak up uh, uh, to, to be able to sort, sort of share some of your insights. And remember that the, giving a little bit more than less, it allows other people to build off of your ideas and your, your, your insights and your thoughts. Maybe if we can copy the questions over into the chat, Danny, then I can also take off the, the screen share and we can all just see each other and have, and have a conversation. I'll do that right now. So awesome. feel free to take it off. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, so Mahin, if you don't mind uh, uh, me putting you on the spot a little bit, can you tell me a little bit more about that? The, the, and and try, let, try to get as precise and specific as you as you as you can. Um, so, I would say starting with those who sort of in. I know that we're supposed to start from the future, but I can't take systems of oppression out of my head. So I'm thinking if we start with those individuals who fall at the intersection of multiple systems of oppression and consequently get locked out of 
the economy we live in today. So for example, like if we start with trans women from indigenous communities um, as the core beneficiaries, then we ultimately end up building a more inclusive economy because we're starting with those who would have been otherwise left out. Awesome, 100%. And, and I, I would say building on that, that there's actually even, there's, there's incredibly good evidence that suggests that you know, more diverse teams are more financially successful in organizations. It's clearly shown at the board level. It's clearly shown at the team level for innovation, and it's clearly shown at the organizational level. And so you're talking about a net benefit of an economy being that there's more people participating from more unique uh, perspectives. And innovation, by definition, is at the intersection of ideas and cultures that that have that might not have intersected before. And so the removal of these system of oppressions ultimately, you're increasing the pool of innovation and the pool of innovators and the and the quality of ideas across the board. Thank you. Do you, do you want to speak to, 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 to the, to the uh, comment on girls and women, uh, Nama, if I'm saying your name right? Yes, hi. So um, I always quote um, Linda Gates. I know this is a kind of associate. <laughs> I do quote her always <laughs> when I started this kind of conversation that um, no matter uh, where you're born, your chances are your life are gonna be harder. It's gonna be harder if you're born a girl. Um, so obviously this is true in developing countries, but it's also true here and it's also true really everywhere, anywhere in the world. Um, so I've spent uh, the past couple of years, well, way more than that, talking to girls um, and young women about things that hold them back and their experience and obviously growing up as a girl and as a woman, um, I felt the same pressures and obstacles. And um, it is just so much harder from day one um, to develop your um, identity as someone who can do things, you know, from the playground, um, from the things you're allowed, you're supposed to do, from the place that you're um, that you're told you fit in where and where you don't fit in and what you are expected to achieve and what you're not expected to achieve. And it starts very, very early um, and it continues and um, throughout school and then into college and then into the professional careers and your life. And, you know, women are underrepresented in almost every professional sector. Um, yeah, so they would be a huge beneficiary of uh, an equal economy. Yeah, enormous, right? And so, and so again, again, you're talking about really clear future benefits that we can see. And, and you don't need to, I mean, we're not talking about magic happening. We're talking about things that are, are, we're, you know, you're more empowered, you feel like you belong, you'll actually show up, you'll bring your great ideas. Yeah. So as a, I'm as also a psychiatrist, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. And, um, one thing that we've never been taught in medical school, I don't want to take too much time, but uh, rates of depression and anxiety in women and girls are way higher than they are in boys and men. And one of the contributors to that is their experiences. So if we can change their experience, um, we will also lower those um, mental health problems, which will be huge for everything, you know, for our economy as well. If you want to think in terms of money, it will be beneficial yeah. to our economy. Yeah, so. no, uh, uh, yeah, hundred um, percent. Uh, Bahar, would you like to, to share anything uh, anything about the social cost comment? Sure. Um, when we have um, um, an equal economy, as you described, Todd, we uh, we get our the motivation of our youth, which are our future, right? So. Um, and with having a, a more uh, motivated youth in the, in the pool of the economy and pool of the society, I mean, um, in one of the social, um, uh, social capital that we want to count on is the, the, the energy of the youth, what, the, what they bring to the society, um, the um, a quality of life experience, all of that are the social capital that comes from the increased motivation. And as a result of that comes the productivity. Um, of the society in, as a whole, but also in the, you know, this just sense of being productive for youth and sense of having motivation and sense of having a higher quality of life. So 
Um, I think it's, I mean, it, both with just thinking about the equal economy, but also thinking about um, just focusing on youth and kind of like giving them that perspective that this is not only a place to express and be healthy, but how that actually makes sense for them, you know, um, and to live uh, in a society that has that. Um, so, it's, so that's a big um, kind of like a social uh, perspective that uh, could help us. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And, and, and I can, you can totally imagine how the effect of that happens leads to presenty and absenteeism. I mean, there were some great studies that were done just about eyesight and the fact that, you know, if you, if you start having visual problems and you don't have glasses when you're in school, then that leads to this cascading effect of ultimately, you know, uh, you know, you know, it, it, you know the, the butterfly effect is tremendous. It's pronounced at the end of it because it starts with, you know, you not having confidence or you not willing to try because you don't think you belong or, or, or something around there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. In, in my experience, I, um, I have, uh, I'm a dental public health consultant and um, looking at uh, that field, you know, just how you see that, um, con that kind of like an ignored areas of health, right? How that contributes to like a child kind of thriving, right? Um, so it, it's, it's the same, same concept in my mind. Um, yeah, and and th thanks for sharing the uh, the um, the study from Guinness, uh, uh, Amy. There's there's some there's some there's some uh, um, really wonderful studies out there that show, um, without the shadow of any doubt, that diversity that diversity leads to financial success. I mean, and that doesn't even talk about you know all the other benefits and upsides that you have. I mean, that's just the easy stuff to measure. Um, Kevin, do you want do you want to speak a little bit a little bit to what those cost? You're kind of hitting at some of the costs as well. I mean, and and, and would love to hear you kind of explore um, in a bit more detail. You know, the issues that you're talking about specifically in young adulthood and, and adulthood, because again, the the avoidance of a, of an expense is also, as we think about it, a pool of capital that we can bring to the conversation and bring to the table earlier rather than later. And this is, these are real things that we're talking about and real things that we're exploring. So, so <laughs> thank you in advance for helping us, helping us with our thinking. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm interested in the field of, of mental health and, and it's known that mental health issues, they're either coming from early childhood or actually from the teen years. And if they're not dealt with in the, the teen and young adult years, it's, it's actually, they can grow into real mental health issues and sickness that will cause you to not be able to work or not be able to be a, a like a, a, co a contributor in society so it's really important to catch those early and and what i like about the kind of economy that you describe it's it's an inclusive economy and it's an economy that's built on awareness that we're in this together and that we're actually that we're you know that we're a whole that we're one humanity that's actually building this life. And I think this, this anything that is created through an, a heightened consciousness or a broader awareness is actually, it's, it's, it's just going to actually raise the way we live together on this planet. So I think it's, uh, it's building something that's built on awareness and consciousness is per se is going to lead to something good and inclusive. Yeah. Thank you, Eva. And if, if any ideas are being sparked, please feel please um, uh, feel free to raise your hand. We only have a, a, a few more a few more minutes. But uh, Greta, would you um, uh, would you would you care to sort of uh, sort of uh, share a little bit a little bit more about your comment? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, you know, I think one of the things I uh, run a startup that focuses on Gen Z women, although we are starting to get a lot of young men come into our product who are otherized. And we see a lot of time that Gen Z has so much access to the world's information, right? Like it's all in their hand 24 seven, but often what they lack is the perspective and wisdom to process it. And so I, you know, hearing everybody's comments is, is really exciting. Um, and I'm, I, I firmly believe that Gen Z, um, you know, and they're already doing this, is creating massive innovation and there's a huge opportunity for them to innovate, but they need, wisdom perspective, right? The ability to get through those things on emotional and mental level. I think like Kevin was saying at an early age, if we can help them work through those things, get this perspective um, and then allow them to do what they do best, which is like soak up this knowledge, use the tech tools um, to, to innovate. I just see that there's unlimited potential there to solve a lot of the problems um, that we're you know, dealing with right now. <clears throat> 
Yeah, re re really, really appreciate that, Greta. And 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 Michelle, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to sort of speak to this. I mean, this is this is you know what, what you're talking about is actually really interesting. I mean, there's 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 been some really interesting. Uh, conversations that we've re uh, engaged in in reg regard to the community with some First Nations communities, um, a few in Canada and some in Mexico, particularly with the Mayan community. And I, and I think that, again, that you're seeing that we, we have, in, I mean, in the West, we have taken one approach to the relationship between capital and the development of markets. And uh, uh, and that, that actually, when, the, when those economic efforts lead to substantial social and environment, uh, environmental problems, um, it, it, might, it actually sometimes is far more expensive if we actually could see into the future about the cost that it would actually have. You know, we, we see uh, the costs of the privatization of the healthcare industry in the United States with the absence of PPE as, as the supp PPE supply chain evaporated during the time of COVID. You know? You know, at the end of the day, we're trying to figure out how to make the world better, and we're going to swing the wrong directions here and there. But I, but I think that, that drawing this is an opportunity for us to draw and understand a healthier future that we can actually invest in, that that ultimately we can actually, uh, e even from a strictly cost perspective, um, uh, you know, you know, uh, could end up, you know, sort of in in the realm of more intelligent investment. So. So I know that we're 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 right at, we're close to time, but Michelle, I was wondering if I could give you maybe the last word before we before we uh, before we wrap up. And, th and thank you all so much for uh, for joining us. If you have ideas that you didn't share, I would also really encourage you to reach out to us um, and to share some of those I ideas. Or if you or if you you'd like to, to to think with us, or you know, as as this is something that we're actively that we're actively working towards. Please, Michelle. Thank, thank you, Todd. I I would just say this that you know. Um, there's power in words and how that interpretation comes to any of us or a youth especially is all relative and not understanding where that person's coming from and what their interpretation of it is, is so important, whether it be legal, political, cultural, or just, uh, you know, just everyday vocabulary. I think sometimes it gets lost in translation. And especially for our native people, you know, there's, there's indigenous ways of knowing and understanding and culture and tradition. And then you have the Western framework. And I think sometimes they may not always sync up. So I just think that um, as I'm thinking about how you're speaking and how the conversation is going, you know, it's just my mindset is in a completely different area. And I think of geography, the rural to the urban, you hear about the have and the have nots, you know, and just simply today we're having internet connection issues and we're in urban corridors. So what does that tell you if you're trying to reach a young person who's out over the mountain or in a rural area, you know, there's, there's an exclusion and an inclusion depending on who has what and where they're at. And um, so I could go on, but that was just my two cents worth and just also too with the social costs. Um, technology is wonderful. However, sometimes we forget the basics, you know, communication and, and that gets lost between our elders and our older people and, and our young people. And so, um, yeah, but thank you for letting me be a part of the group today. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing for sharing your ideas, Michelle. I, I, that, that, I think that that's precisely the type of thinking um, that we want to incorporate in the design of the financial mechanisms that will then actually finance the development of these economies, so that we're not thinking about about financial well-being separate to social or environmental well-being, but we're actually thinking about an economy ultimately keeping them all healthy. Because otherwise, we're going to run into the brick wall of reality um, if we're not if we're not um, you know if we're not if we're not actively considering uh, sort of what we're investing in and what we're building. Um, and it changes the framework of what you even consider might be an investment if you start to align um, align some of these thinking. So I, I really, really appreciate all your thoughts. I'm sorry we don't get more time time together, but we definitely would encourage you to reach out to us if um, if you'd like to continue the conversation. We'd certainly be keen to. Yes, and I'm just going to share my screen one last time so that you can see what else in case you want to be reminded of what else is happening today. But here is the schedule for a couple of more sessions that are that are going to be going on. There's another one starting right now on the Accelerator 2 Q&A and Headstream Youth Programming Q&A. And as you can see, the day is is full of more 
exciting sessions for you all. So thank you again so much for coming, for sharing your, your insights and, and thoughts with us. It was really um, a great conversation and we hope to engage, engage more with all of you. So thank you again so much.